Great, thank you. I can't read questions with a handheld mic, so you do it. Be bold. <laughs> this is a small mic. Do I know you all? You have her red ID. You better check him out. Can he? Why you that right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. That's great. We all settled. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome um, to Harvard University an old and dear friend, a person I admire so very much, Nicole Hannah Jones. Um, we're going to have a conversation about our monumental, monumental project, 1619, and then um, we'll open it up to questions, if that's okay with you. Then we're going to swoop you away for a lovely dinner. Excellent. Nicole Hannah-Jones is an award-winning investigative reporter covering racial injustice for the New York Times Magazine. She's also, as everyone here knows, uh, the creator of the landmark 1619 Project. In 2017, she received a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship known as the Genius Award for her work on educational inequality. She's also won a Peabody, a George Polk, a National Magazine Award. That's like the trifecta. Probably, yeah, we can move on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a 2018 John Chancellor Distinguished Journalism Award from Columbia University, home of the Pulitzer Center and the Pulitzer Prize. Haven't it's won that one, though. <laughs> <In two laughs> <laughs> yeah, funny. We're never going to get through this. We keep cracking these two. <laughs> In 2016, Nicole co-founded something that so many scholars in, in this room. And uh, we all know the importance of branding and naming and institution building. And that's why we're here, because different academics uh, and students started our great department of um, what is now African and African American Studies in 1969. And then different scholars founded the Du Bois Institute. And then Anthony Appiah and I and Bill Wilson and Cornell West and Larry Bobo and Marcy Morgan founded the Hutchins Center in which the Du Bois Institute is now housed. Founding these institutions um, is of enormous importance to um, establishing the foundation, the study of our people, and perpetuating the, uh, and continuing the study of our people. And I say that because Nicole actually co-founded the Ida B. Wells Society for Investigative Reporting. Ida B. Wells is not only one of the first, if not the first, black investigative reporters, but one of the first uh, investigative reporters in any tradition of any gender and of any ethnicity. And I really admire you for doing that. And the Ida B. Wells Society is a training and mentorship organization geared towards increasing the numbers of investigative reporters of color. Something dear to my heart, as she knows, because I'm a, a member of the, of the founding board of ProPublica, which is the world's leading center, not for profit, for investigative journalism. She was one of our superstars who was swooped away, <laughs> much to our chagrin, by the, by the New York Times. Now, we do a lot of things uh, in partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the distinguished writer and thinker, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Uh, Nicole, take us through the history of the 1619 Project. I mean, did you wake up in the middle of the night one, and just say, oh my God, 1619, the anniversary. How did you get the idea? Uh, so first, just thank you for having me. Um, I was a uh, 
history and African American studies major when I was in college, and I just feel like I've been like reading a scholarship my whole life. Um, and it's actually a little bit intimidating to sit on the stage with you and talk about uh, black history. So don't don't fact check me as I'm, <laughs> as I'm talking. Um, but I'm in really what year did Crispus here. Attucks <laughs> die? <laughs> Yeah, when I was on your documentary, I was like, you're interviewing me? I, I feel like you were going to fact check me, but you did. She, she was fabulous. In the Reconstruction, she was, you were outstanding. It was great. It was um, one of my favorite documentaries Thank that you. I've watched. I love that period. One um, of the favorites. The, it was the favorite. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Documentary on Reconstruction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that I'll take I've that. Ever seen. I'll take that. Um, <laughs> anyway, so, you know, it's interesting because in some ways, I've been building to this project since I was a high school student. That's when I first came across the date 1619. Uh, I went to a majority white high school. I was bused into that high school. Uh, Where was that? It was in Waterloo, Iowa. Iowa? Ain't no black people out there. And you know, what I say is there's a couple of us everywhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> I always joke. So it's, it, uh, my family got to Iowa the same migration pattern that took black folks from Mississippi to Chicago. Uh, the Illinois Central Rail Line stopped in Waterloo first, and I always say we were so country we got off the train too early and didn't realize we hadn't <laughs> quite made it to the big city. Um, but it's the same, it's the exact same folks who went to Chicago. Um, and so I, even though there aren't a lot of black people in Iowa, there are enough black people in my town to segregate us. And uh, hmm. in the 1970s, my hometown entered into a voluntary desegregation agreement with the um, U.S. Department of Education, and I was bused as part of that program. Uh, so anyway, so our high school offered a one semester black studies course and I took that one semester course with the first black male, first and only black male teacher I ever had hmm. and uh, I often liken it to that moment in uh, Spike Lee's Malcolm X movie when Malcolm X is in the jail cell and Elijah Muhammad comes to him in a vision and his life right. is never the same. Yeah. Taking that course was kind of like that for me because um, in that one semester which covered uh, ancient Africa all the way to uh, 1968, right? right. <laughs> um, was more history about black folks than I'd ever gotten in my entire life. Mm -hmm. And I just remember uh, being very angry. I uh, understand why we weren't taught this history because it kind of radicalized me. Um, I realized that you know all these years when I thought black people hadn't contributed anything outside of letting white people own us and then letting white people free us, um, that there was all this history that could have been taught to us and wasn't. And I, and I realized then that that was intentional. So uh, I really got this insatiable appetite to read this history. And when that class ended, I would keep going back to that teacher and asking him, give me another book. And I'd read a book and he'd give me another. And one of those books was uh, Before the Mayflower oh, by wow. Jerome Bennett. Right. And that was the first black history book I ever read. Yeah, and it was like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. So I think page 29 I, or 30, I read 16, it in, is in, on there. I in installments mm. in Ebony. And then he gathered those installments, and then that's how old I when am. When was that? Yeah, right, before, uh, <laughs> long before the internet. <laughs> yeah. He a used to elderly. write a column in Ebony in the 60s. Uh. And it would come every month, and I would read another chapter. I even wrote him a letter when I was 15 or 16, it was probably when in the trash, just saying, dear sir, I believe that uh, you should collect these esses and put them in a book. Really? And I, yeah, and it became... Uh, he did. So that, there was no cause before the Mayflower is due to you. No, no. <laughs> I cannot take credit for that. <laughs> but I did have the pleasure of meeting him later, and I told him exactly what you said. That was the first, um, my introduction to black history yes. was Lerone Bennett in Ebony Magazine, which then was collected into uh, Before, before the, the Mayflower. Mayflower. Yeah. Um, it was transformative. And, yep. you know, you, you look at the title, which talks about the Mayflower in 1620. Mm -hmm. And on page, like I said, 20, 28, 29, something like that in my version, was 1619, which mm -hmm. was another ship called the White Lion. But everyone in America knows about the Mayflower. Mm -hmm. And I realized even then as a high school student, none of us had ever been taught about this other ship, the mm -hmm. White Lion, and there was a reason. So uh, people who know me know that I've talked about 1619 since then. I've thought about it since then. Um, and then, you know, fast forward a couple years since I was in high school. Um, and probably last year, I started thinking a lot about the fact that this anniversary was approaching and that uh, most Americans still had never heard of the year 1619. And that, like almost everything else about the black experience, um, this anniversary, 400 years, was likely going to pass without most of us knowing anything about it. And there would be some tributes, but it wouldn't reach really the general population. 
And here I am at the New York Times, and I have a platform to do something about that. So I started thinking about what, what would that look like? Would I write an essay about it? Would I do a piece? Um, and then I think I might have gotten a Twitter argument, which rarely you know, happens, <laughs> but once in a while. Um, and someone said, you know, uh, the thing that every black person hears, slavery was a long time ago, why don't you get over it? Hmm. And I just was like, we're gonna, I'm going to pitch a project that is not a history that actually looked at the modern legacy and uh, makes the argument that almost nothing across modern American life was left untouched by that decision in 1619. That mm -hmm. even things that we think have nothing to do with racism, that we think have nothing to do with slavery, uh, can actually be traced back to either the political, social, cultural, legal uh, norms that begun, begin to get established when we decide to uh, buy that first group of Angolans. Um, and so that's what I did. I, I, I didn't want it to just be about the past. I, I wanted to answer that question, which is, we can't get over slavery because America hasn't gotten over slavery. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to get over slavery more than black folks, because we're the ones who suffer the legacy. No, that's true. But, but yet, the legacy is all around us. Um, and a single article, I, don't, I just didn't think would do it justice, that to really land into the world, it needed to be a survey across American life, and it means something when it's in the New York Times, the paper or record, and that, that would bring, I knew that would bring a tremendous power to it. So that's kind of, so I don't know if I was asleep or awake, mm -hmm. arguing on Twitter, but I just know I had uh, a moment where I, I decided that was what I was going to pitch. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, I particularly want our students to follow your answers um, to, to that and the next question. Okay. Which is how you tra how do you turn an idea into a thing? Yeah. You know how do you you, you wake up you say you go to work um, you ca did you call dean did you call the editor of the magazine did you um, huddle with take your colleagues to lunch how did you go from this idea knowing that 2019 was the 400th right. anniversary of the arrival of the first slave ship to the British colonies and as we now know they were Angola. So how do you take that concept and turn it into a special issue of the New York Times Magazine, which they rarely ever do? Yeah, um, so I, I was on book leave for a year that turned into a year and a half. You know how this goes sometimes. Still didn't <laughs> finish the book. Um, and, I, and so the first thing, when I came back to the New York Times in January, I had this plan that I was really just going to be low key so that I could mostly just keep working on my book and produce a little something here and there for the magazine. Um, and then like a week later, I go in and pitch, you know, 1619 Project. So the plan of being low key didn't really work out. Um, and I went to my editor and I was like, I have this idea. And I had thought through um, some of the arguments I knew we were going to make. I knew I wanted an essay on capitalism. I knew I wanted an essay on why we have the stingiest social safety net of uh, all Western industrialized countries. I wanted one on democracy, um, probably politics. So there were some that I knew I wanted. And uh, I just went and said, have you ever heard of the year 1619? No. Well, it's the 400th anniversary of the first uh, Africans being sold into Virginia. And I really think we should do this assessment that shows all across American life. Um, so it's just a casual conversation with her. Mm -hmm. And she said, OK, well, we should pitch it to Jake, Jake Silverstein, who's the editor in chief of the magazine. Right. Every week we have a, um, a weekly ideas meeting where we toss about story ideas. At the end of that meeting, I brought it up. And the number one question I get is, how did you get the New York Times to do this? It must mm -hmm. have been very hard. Um, I understand why people ask that question, but it really wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, I pitched the idea to take over an entire magazine, and at that meeting, he said, let's do it. Um, wow. It Jake, was, Jake yeah, did. Yeah, immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, it grew much larger. I didn't pitch a podcast. I didn't pitch the uh, special section of the newspaper. Um, it just kept growing bigger and bigger because uh, I guess what I would tell students is, one, like, know your shit. Like, I, I, mm -hmm. I know. I, I don't know as much as you, but I've been reading obsessively about this for 25 years. Mm -hmm. I've been thinking about these things for a long time. And my work has been kind of trying to make this argument through my writing about education and uh, housing segregation that all of these uh, inequalities in those areas can be traced back to slavery as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I, I think I just had, I had an argument that they hadn't heard before. Um, and I also had garnered enough trust that uh, I can deliver on things that I um, yes. pitch. And I believe uh, that that record is well established. <laughs> so because I had a freedom, I think to pitch something that probably would have been harder for uh, someone else, mm -hmm. um, a black woman at an institution like that to pitch. And one of the things I want the um, students to remember um, is that there were other 16, 19 projects yes. floating around. I mean, this is not the, the only one. This became the most controversial one, but it wasn't the only one. Uh, Jamestown, uh, uh, John Thornton and Linda Haywood contacted me three years ago and said that they were going to be involved with that. The Association of Study of African American Life and History, Evelyn, led by Evelyn Brooks, Brooks Higginbotham, was planning programming. Everybody was planning programming. Yes. I mean, it was just a big deal. But yours, boom, this is like um, the nuclear explosion because of the reach of the New York Times, right? So, we, and we'll come to that in part two of this the discussion, which will be about some of the reactions um, to the, the issue. Yes. So, but we're a long way from there. How, what did you see as the power of a single year in time, 1619, and why did you want to focus the American mind on it, almost symbolically, as the starting point of our national story in the way that you and your co-writers have defined our national story? Yes, so I think that part of the power of the project was clearly the reach of the times, but had it been a safe project that simply was a commemorative project, I don't think it would have had that impact. I think it was uh, the evocative nature of the argument, an argument saying, actually, uh, 1776 is not our true founding. Mm -hmm. Our true founding, when you look at uh, the development of the United States uh, across institutions, was really um, the system of racialized slavery, that it was both corrosive to the United States, uh, it is, you know, at the bedrock of our founding hypocrisy. Um, the most deadly war that we ever fought was over this institution, um, that you can look at the creation of American culture, just all of these areas that that really was the moment. Um, and then to center black people in a way in the American story that we clearly are not mm -hmm. mainstream. I mean, you know, in African American studies, we understand that, but mainstream society treats black people as a problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, I did a, do a Google search on the Negro problem or the black problem, and oh you my will God. run out of pages. Like, you'll get tired of clicking pages. And one of Du Bois' most famous lines is, how does how it feel, does it feel to, to be a, a problem? problem? Right. We are, you know, and so it wasn't just that we were saying, this is the 400th anniversary. It was saying, this thing that has been treated as marginal, we in the New York Times, a paper of record, are going to treat it as central. Mm -hmm. And we're going to make the argument that the story of black America is actually the true story of America. I think that is largely um, why people responded to it. Um, and then again, that it was uh, placed in, the, in today, right now. That it wasn't just simply looking backwards, but saying, look at your country right now. We're going to explain. Um, I'm wearing a lot of red today, so this analogy is going to work, but like the, uh, the red pill in the matrix. Uh -huh. That's how I describe the 1619 Project, is like suddenly that. you see the architecture that built your society that has been largely hidden from you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that to me is, is why people responded to it in that way. I don't remember what your question was. What was your question? No, no. The question was, what, what do you see as the power uh, of the single year in time? You, know, uh, uh, uh. You, you, you recognize an anniversary, yes. but you uh, exploded it, its symbolic power. Yes. That process is what I want you to uh -huh. share with me. And you are sharing it. Your answer is, is superb. Well, and part of I it, love the red pill. Thank you. Um, did, had you planned to say that and that's why you wore red? No, I mean, no. Matrix is one of my favorite movies for that reason, because okay. I just think it's, I always thought it served as a great uh, analogy for uh, America and the work that those of us who are trying to expose the racial architecture of America do. So I've always thought that. My husband says why I dyed my hair red, but that's not true. I just, <laughs> I just, well, uh, Counselor West and, and I had dinner last night, but he unfortunately couldn't be here from the major. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> um, I haven't seen him since I was a student at University of North Carolina. It would have been uh, great to see him. Um, so I think that the value of a single year 
in America, which is a young country, mm -hmm. when do you get the opportunity to commemorate 400 years of anything? Mm -hmm. You don't. Um, but then to kind of blow people's mind with that, actually, we, we uh, engaged in institutional slavery just 12 years after the English landed Jamestown. Mm -hmm. I think that that, uh, I don't think every date would have gotten that reaction, mm -hmm. but I think that that was a shocking, I know it was, because I'm you know, giving talks all over the country, mm -hmm. uh, that that was a shocking thing to people, mm -hmm. that, that we would have engaged in slavery 400 years ago, that almost nothing in our country predates that, mm -hmm. or uh, I think was very shocking. Um, but then to, again, not just commemorated as marking a moment, mm -hmm. because the project is not about a moment, it's about the spark uh, that that moment begins, um, I think is useful to us. And I think a lot about if uh, this 400th anniversary had occurred, for instance, under the Obama administration, mm -hmm. would this project have uh, received the same reaction? What's the answer? I don't think so. I, I think it, it is a great project on its own. Mm -hmm. We worked really hard on it. But we're clearly in a moment in time where people are searching for, like, how the hell did we get here? They right. want to understand. Um, and and a, a project like this lands differently under the first black president, right. where the narrative is we have overcome something. Right. Then now, where the narrative is we clearly have gone backwards, or we right. have retrenched, or we have uh, the, the water of American racism has found its level yes. that it always reaches. Right. A way to think of it is how do we get back here? Yes. You, you know, there, there were, I interviewed Andrew Young, a, a man um, still underestimated, mm -hmm. I, I think, by history. Though, you know, he was the first black mayor of Atlanta, he was a congressman from, first black congressman from Georgia, yes. et cetera. He's um, a genius. He said he thought our people were still on a freedom high <laughs> from Barack. Mm -hmm. And they, are, they yeah. are not aware of this moment of danger when these zombies of white supremacy are coming up out of the bowels of the earth, mm. and we thought they were dead and, and long gone. So you're saying, um, had, you, had, 16, 19, had Barack Obama been president, we'd still be on the Freedom Hunt. <laughs> and nobody would have cared so much. I think we would have cared to a less. I just think it would have, uh, it would have hit people in a different way. Mm -hmm. I, just, I think it would, have, it would have been seen more as looking backwards mm -hmm. than really instructive about where we are today. Well, because a lot of people were fooled into the ridiculous narrative that we were somehow post-racial. Post yes. And I, I mean, when people write the history, this is going to be the history of one of the fo most foolish ideas of black intellectuals um, and American intellectuals. That somehow the election of one man, one no man. matter how splendid he might be, had erased 400 years of anti-black racism, yes. institutional race, is ridiculous. It is, if any of my students are written, I'd give them an F. <laughs> but, but, but you had a cottage industry of people writing books about that. But I think that speaks to like, uh, I mean, this is, this is why the 1619 Project was necessary, because um, the average American, like we, we have been sold this idea that um, we have always been making forward progress, and we don't really need to think about that, and we can be liberated from our foundation. And so I think it is almost natural that uh, if you look at you know, the arc of history that, which I actually say is a circle that just keeps turning back on itself in some ways, um, that the idea that electing this one black man was all the redemptive narrative that we needed. Right. Because we, we so want to be free of this legacy without addressing the legacy. Yes. And having a black figurehead allows you to pretend to be free of something without actually having to address it. Yes. I mean, I say all the time, uh, most of my career as a journalist was about a little more than half writing under Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was writing about the most deeply entrenched school segregation, housing segregation in blue cities, mm -hmm. in blue states. Mm -hmm. And um, just the way that uh, a single black man doesn't change that reality, neither does a single white nationalist in the White House change that reality, That's right? That's true. Um, it's a good way to put it. None of these things matter, which is why the project, it's not that they don't matter. Uh, Obama mattered um, mm -hmm. and Trump matters, but the project doesn't really address either one of them. No. Because this is about 400 years and uh, all of the things that we write about will exist long after uh, both of them are gone. Absolutely. Um, one person does not constitute no. such a seismic shift that it erases, uh, you know, centuries of history. That's just crazy. That's right. And it speaks to how we've never been able to really deal with 
race and racism in a nuanced way. Mm -hmm. So you look at the coverage after uh, the election when that slice of white Obama voters went to Trump. Mm -hmm. And all of the initial coverage was like, well, it couldn't be racism because mm -hmm. how could they have voted for Obama and voted for Trump? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, have you studied history? But the answer is, of course, no, <laughs> right? Most, most journalists haven't really deeply studied this history. But the, you know, white people, of course, can vote for a black man if they think it's in their best interest. And as mm -hmm. soon as they don't think it's in their best interest, then they can revert back to whiteness, which is often the best interest. And, and I think we just don't have a sophistication uh, in, in dealing with these issues. So is, is, um, you, there's a part of you, I, I've always thought, who wanted to be a professor. I did. Okay. So is this your way of uh, <laughs> sticking your, I never ask you that. Not like we hang out, don't get me wrong. We've just admired he each other. He keeps saying he's going to invite me out to the, where, where is it, this Martha's, Martha's Vineyard? Vineyard, but to still the, waiting on that invitation. To the, the Hutchins Forum. <laughs> the Hutchins Forum. I thought I stayed Forum. in this public space right now. <laughs> Maybe that'll. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, every August we have a big debate at the Old Whaling Church, the Hutchins Forum. And we try to get people from the, left and the right. It's increasingly harder to get people in the right I bet. after the last presidential election. But I promise, okay. uh, before, before this audience and Jesus, <laughs> that, we will, that we will invite you. So was this your foray into uh, the academy, as it um, were? You know, making your historical scholarly debut. I wouldn't go that far. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I mean, I mostly relied on other people's scholarship. Sure, um, and you did that very well. Thank you. Uh, but what I will say, I mean, I was a, I was a history and African American studies major, mm -hmm. and I still say the history is my first love. Mm -hmm. And all of my work, um, all of my writing, about two thirds of it all is in the past. Mm -hmm. And I do do some uh, original um, research, but it just wasn't in this project. So I think that when I was in, um, undergraduate and I was trying to decide what I was going to do after graduate school and was I going to be a journalist or was I going to be a historian. I really felt, uh, and, and you know, don't take this the wrong way, but the historians write for uh, largely history nerds like myself mm -hmm. and uh, college students, but journalists write clearly for the masses. Yes. And that the way to uh, both be able to look backwards but also hopefully change the things in society that I felt were unjust right now, I felt the best thing for me would be to be a journalist, but uh, a journalist whose work is based deeply uh, in the study of history. So I, um, I think it was the right thing for me, but I, I love history, and uh, I think I, in some ways, am trying to write uh, a people's history that just regular folks, like my uh, family back home, uh, I come from a very working class family, and They've never read, you know, history books outside of what they were assigned in, mm -hmm. in high school. Mm -hmm. But they read this project. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's really, I think, the power of what journalism can do. And mm -hmm. I know that's what the uh, power of um, historians who manage to cross over can do. Mm -hmm. But I think that's, it's just more challenging. Well, and think about it. Think about the best uh, journalists writing. I mean, everyone here would have their list. But when I think about, I love The New Yorker. My friends are the editors of The New Yorker. Um, um, Malcolm Gladwell, he doesn't have a PhD in psychology, but he writes brilliantly about um, psychology. Um, and the list goes on. David Remnick, um, Remnick doesn't have an advanced degree, but he's um, a genius and can yes. translate complicated ideas, just like Malcolm can, yes. into a way that reaches millions of people, literally, cumulatively, rather than writing a monograph that reaches 1,000 people or even 5,000 people as in the, the case of scholars. And we need both forms of discourse. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't do my work without scholars, period. Mm. Um, all of my work relies heavily on scholarship. And uh, at its best, when we're making sure that we're crediting the scholars whose work we use, I mm -hmm. think it is, it is a, a beautiful symbiotic relationship because uh, scholars often rely on us to get their scholarship out to a wider audience. Of course. And I, I, again, I just, I couldn't write a single thing that I write without scholarship. And I actually feel debilitated if I haven't had enough time to read a ton of books and papers when I have to write something because I, I just never, I feel like I don't have enough to make my argument without it, particularly writing about race. I think you right. have to so thoroughly build your case 
to convince people uh, when you're writing about race in a way that you don't always have to in other fields. Yeah, and I'd add a uh, person like Adam Gopnik mm. to that list. Brent Staples. Brent Staples. Oh, Brent for sure. Brent, on the other side, as a PhD in psychology from yes. the University of Chicago, just won the Pulitzer Prize. Yes, he did. One of my oldest friends. But he decided not to be an academic and yes. to write for the editorial page. And, and, and does a, a an brilliant. amazing amount of he does. Uh, historical research. And yeah. never uses jargon, but always has that informed point of view. That's right. So you've chosen to be on one side of the discursive line and reach out toward the other. So yes. let's talk about that. How did you gather the voices who would help you tell this story? OK, you had the idea. You go to the pitch meeting to your astonishment. They go, we're going to give you the whole thing. You go, <laughs> wow, I should ask for more. <laughs> How did you, and then how did, how did you pick them? And then how did you orchestrate them to write individual pieces that would become part of a whole that would, in terms of content, be rather wide ranging over both time and space? Yeah, so uh, it's kind of like, you know, when someone tells you you can do something and then you're like, oh shit, like I have to pull this <laughs> off. Um, and what, what I wanted to do was just incredibly fraught. There's so many ways you could mess it up uh, when you're trying to do kind of like uh, lay people scholarship. You know that all of the actual experts are going to be reading everything and combing through it, which we'll be talking, I'm sure, about some of that <laughs> later. Um, and so it was really important. I mean, I, just as a, a, a lay person who's interested in history, read a lot and thought a lot about this, but clearly I am not. Uh, the single mind who should decide what we're going to write about. Um, so uh, probably within two weeks of uh, getting the approval, I emailed a bunch of scholars who I engage with on Twitter and whose work I read across some of the areas that I wanted us to touch on and asked them to come in for a brainstorming session. Mm -hmm. um, again, I, I knew some of the essays I wanted, but I wanted to know with this conceit, which is uh, take something in modern America uh, that would be surprising to people and trace it, trace it back to slavery or uh, the anti-black racism that developed from slavery. Oh, that's a great idea. Um, that's a great. Yeah, that was that yeah. was the the whole conceit. I wanted, I didn't want to tell stories that people thought they knew. Mm -hmm. I wanted, if you never read uh, a single word in the essay, but just flipped through the magazine and read the the uh, headlines, the titles. I wanted just doing that for you to be shocked. Oh God, sugar traffic, mm -hmm. uh, you know, democracy, healthcare. I wanted that conceit to, to be surprising to people. Um, anyway, so that, so you know, Annette Gordon-Reed, Martha Jones, uh, Ed Baptist, uh, Kevin Cruz, they were just a group of folks whose scholarship I had read in recent years that I thought was evocative um, that I asked to come in and brainstorm with us. And then we had separate brainstorm meeting with just writers that I admire mm -hmm. and asked them what their ideas would be and just created a, a long list and try to figure out which, which were, one, the most surprising, and which cases could we make the strongest argument right. in a limited amount of space. The magazine actually ran at twice the length of our normal magazine. Yep. Uh, we just kept adding uh, pages. Uh, I don't know how they paid for it. I don't ask no questions. Um, <laughs> I think they've been paid <laughs> back for their investment. <laughs> right, luckily it, it you know, was successful. It could have gone the other way. And, and of course, this is always the most fraught thing when you're like a black person in an organization like this, is if you uh, convince them to do something that hasn't been done and it fails, you'll never get another chance to do it again. Right, that's so true. that pressure was like mm -hmm. in my mind all the time. And like every part of it, I was trying to think like, I, I need to bulletproof this. I need it to, it has to work. Like it has to be good. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just winnowed and winnowed and winnowed until we had like what we thought were our best ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and then we asked, you know, some of the ideas came, like the traffic piece, that was Kevin Cruz's idea. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, Kevin Cruz writes for popular media because mm -hmm. we also needed folks who... Uh, could write. <laughs> could write for, you know, in a, in a magazine style. And magazine writing is a particular style. It is indeed. Um, it's different from newspaper writing. There's a lot of newspaper writers who can't write uh, in a magazine style. And it... It couldn't be a dry history. I don't, I don't think any history is dry, but it, it had to be something that would bring people in with narrative and that you could get a regular person to read. So uh, some of the people were people who uh, 
uh, scholars who pitched us and some are just writers. Like I just knew I wanted Matt Desmond to write mm -hmm. something for it because mm -hmm. uh, he does amazing scholarship but also just writes in such a beautiful, compelling way. But mm -hmm. I didn't know what. Right. Um, so it was a mix of those things. But it's very important, that, and I want to underscore this, because you did consult with scholars. Absolutely. You brought in. Um, and scholars fact-checked everything. And of course, and at least two and a half. Matt used to be um, at Harvard and yes. then decamped for Princeton. Much to many of our... Taya uh, Miles, yep. who's oh, in there. That's right. Um, um, Taya. Khalil and Muhammad. That's right. Khalil, who couldn't be here because of the weather. Yes. And he sent his regrets. Annette Gordon-Reed won the Pulitzer Prize. Yes. Uh, and she's a person who outed Thomas Jefferson, finally. <laughs> yes. So, you know, you had some serious scholars, black and white. Absolutely. Um, to start with. You don't, <laughs> you don't make an argument like this that you know is going to be controversial and not try to bulletproof it as much as you can. Mm -hmm. right? I, I, I have not gotten this far by just doing dumb shit. Like I, I, <laughs> I mean, I, I understood. I understood what it meant. And I understood that people would be wanting to pick it apart. And while so much of history is contested just in general, it's the nature of it, sure. um, it was important that we tried our best to get things right. Um, and also that we tried our best I felt a, a, an immense pressure to get it right, particularly for black folks, that mm -hmm. we would not read it and feel demeaned by it, that uh, so much of the history is so hard, uh, but I didn't want it just to be you know, a catalog of our oppression. Like all of those things right. were- Buked and scorned. You didn't want one more narrative. I've been buked, I've been scorned. Yeah, it's gotta it, be more complicated. But then you have to tell the story of the brutality and the oppression because of that's course. also, like, that's our story. So it was all of those things and, and uh, trying to find that balance uh, and, and just thinking about everything. But we all relied heavily on uh, existing scholarship. Uh, scholarship uh, scholars helped us come up with the ideas and scholars, multiple scholars fact-checked almost every fact that was in there. Now, of course, sometimes, You'd ask four scholars something, and they would have four different ideas on what the true answer was. Right. And in that case, we would make a call. Well, right. this, is, this is the argument we're making. Uh, no one's disputing this. They're just saying. And, and as you know, scholarship is also very nuanced. So it literally could be like one word right. uh, difference. Um, and we made the call, and some scholars don't agree with some of the calls we made, which no, I'm No, but that's with. normal. Uh, but we did make every single attempt not to pretend that I, as a journalist, um, alone uh, without relying on uh, academics could, could do anything like this. We, we, could, we face the same um, problem in the documentary film world. Yeah. Um, and I, as you know, put as many historians, I put 50 historians. <laughs> There's never been a documentary in black history with more historians on camera than, black re than a, a reconstruction film. 50. Half of them women, half of them men. And, um, First of all, thank you for that, because oh. you don't see that a lot. No, and it was important, because I wanted to give these people play. I wanted them to tell the story. And also, though, there, are, there will be people who say, you know, I disagree with her interpretation. Yes. But that's fine. That's what scholarship is. Yes. It's not like you made a mistake. It's just a different call. Yes. Um, some things are errors, historical errors. Some things are just differences of interpretation. Yes. And it's very important to distinguish. Um, those things. What were the biggest challenges that you faced? I mean, and did you ever have any doubts? Did you ever reach a point where you go, this is not going to work. It's too complicated. I'm going to be ambushed. It's just not worth it or not. Uh, so I'll answer your uh, second question last, which is no. There was never, I, I believed, I just believe this was the most important work of my life. Mm -hmm. And um, I had no doubt that we could make the argument that we wanted to make and that we were going to do it in an unflinching way. We we're not going to worry about hurting people's feelings. We we're not going to worry about trying to, uh, you know, uh, one of the, the criticisms has been we didn't give white people enough credit. Uh, I could bring out a Du Bois quote, right, where he <laughs> talks about, like, you know, the people writing the white story are legion. So if I go a little bit overboard for my people, it's actually okay. Uh, so. I was never worried that it wasn't going to work, except I was worried, like, again, my biggest fear, I wasn't worried about scholarship. New York Times has a very uh, extensive fact checking, and on this one, we were doubly uh, careful. But I was, I really was worried, again, like, how would black people react to it? That was mm -hmm. my main concern. I did not want to let us down. Oh. And I didn't want to let, uh, 
I thought so much about the ancestors during this project. Mm -hmm. Like, and I'm not a spiritual person, but uh, I just, it was there. It was almost debilitating. Mm -hmm. um, trying to write my essay while overseeing the whole project uh, and feeling both the, uh, the weight of the ego in that you don't want to pitch this big project and your essay is the weak link. <laughs> um, but also the weight of like, this is the introduction to the whole project and I need, most of the project's going to be hard about what people did to us, and I needed our essay to center us in a different way. So all of that, um, I didn't know if my essay was going to work, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I just wanted, I was just really concerned about how people would respond to it, not in a, um, not historians, but like regular folks. Okay, so that was my next question. It was about intended audience. Mm -hmm. So you have a double audience. You, have, you wanted to tell the story to other black people who didn't know the story, but you also wanted to educate, you know, the New York Times is not jet and ebony, at least back in the <laughs> old days, right? It's <laughs> most, still not. Most of the people read the New York Times Magazine yes. are not in yes, the hood. Yes, yes. So talk to me about that double-voiced audience. Yeah, and I, I would say more than double voice. Um, when people ask who this project was for, I say it was for Americans. Mm -hmm. um, different Americans, would get different things from it, and I intended different Americans to get different things from it. But um, when I write in the project about uh, most uh, black and brown immigrants would not be here had it not been for the black freedom struggle that uh, overturns racist immigration quotas, so maybe you don't get here and try to distance yourself from us. Right. That is a particular message that right. I'm sending to uh, particular groups. Uh, so I wanted black folks to get a sense of like, we, we have a right to claim the country of our birth, even though we are told from the moment we take a breath that this is not really our country, we're not really full citizens. Right. I wanted us to have a sense of um, not you know, flag pin wearing pro patriotic pride, but a patriotic pride that as much democracy as we have and culture we have, like we played a substantial role in creating that. Um, mm -hmm. I thought a lot about myself as a child in this uh, shame that you are awash in as a black person, really from the moment you take your first breath, unless you have parents who mm -hmm. uh, have the ability to teach you a different narrative. Um, and I wanted to empower black folks who always suspect the architecture, but mm -hmm. can't spend 25 years studying it. And right. so mm -hmm. um, can say, well, I, I, I knew this never made sense, but I didn't know why. And for white Americans, I wanted white Americans to be able to see the country for what it is. Mm -hmm. And to stop deifying our founders and our founding uh, and stop thinking about black people as problematic, mm -hmm. uh, but see that the conditions black people have been forced to live in are what's problematic. And stop minimizing stop. the importance of the Absolutely. role of slavery, Absolutely. the enslavement of millions of human beings in the history of the creation of what many people think, I include, the greatest country on the face of the earth. Yes, absolutely. I mean. It goes back to like why 1619. Mm -hmm. There's a reason we all learned 1620. Mm -hmm. There's a reason we all learned the Mayflower, though I would argue that the white line was much more important to the development of who our country would become than the May, than people who were on that Mayflower. Mm -hmm. So when we think about how we create national memory, mm -hmm. it is intentional. And I say this all the time, black people are the most inconvenient thing to the American narrative. <laughs> right. right. The only, now Native Americans are very inconvenient, but we don't even see them on a day-to-day -day basis, mm -hmm. right? We have uh, forced them to the, f the fringe and the periphery of American society. But you can't come into a city and not see black folks, and the only reason we're here is because we were founded on a hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. The only thing we're here is because of a 250-year atrocity that was committed, mm -hmm. and because of that, we have to be marginalized and our stories have to be marginalized. Mm -hmm. And this is an attempt to say, I'm going to explain our country to ourselves by centering this thing that we would all like to pretend is uh, not substantial and that is really foundational. Like, think about how can you learn about George Washington and not the fact that the wealth that allowed him to become the first president was mm -hmm. built on the forced labor and torture mm -hmm. of black people? Mm -hmm. How do you? not tell that narrative. Mm -hmm. And as you know, as a black person, every time you learn history, you're like, well, I don't know how to feel about this. Like, right. how do I feel about World War II? Like the V for Victory campaign mm -hmm. when black people I know mm -hmm. were getting lynched the for wearing a uniform. Right, the double V. So we Which can't, right, and you're calling double. this the greatest generation, but the mm -hmm. greatest generation denied democracy to most of the citizens at home. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, 
so then we're taught like we're crazy, like why are you obsessing over these things? When really, you know, it's it's been a very, as you know, intentional effort to erase all of that. But mm -hmm. then you have to deal with why are we here and why are we suff why are we suffering? Mm -hmm. And if you don't deal with slavery and its legacy, then of course the answer is we just don't want better. Mm -hmm. We have every opportunity as everyone else, and we just don't want better. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the convenient narrative. Mm -hmm. uh, this project is troubling that narrative, but with, you know, facts. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, um, one of the, I, I was um, delighted with a lot of my colleagues to do a um, series on 500 years of African American mm -hmm. history called Many Rivers Across. Mm -hmm. And we started not in 1619, as you know. Yes. We started. In Florida. In Florida. Yes. Um, over 100 years before. So, the first question I have mm -hmm. to ask is, uh, and my wife is a Cuban historian, so when she writes, she goes, 1619, let me talk about my people in, in Florida, right? Yes. So why Jamestown 1619 and not, say, 1526, when students, first African slaves, were taken to a settlement near Sapelo um, Sound in Georgia, or 1565, when the Spanish founded St. Augustine, uh, Florida? Why, what are we gonna do with Spanish America? Um, and I hope you, you're gonna do something about this in the, in the book. Because I looked, every word I was looking at, I said, okay, I understand yes. the symbolic importance of 1619, but what about that first 100 years? So. And there were a lot of black people there. So there were. Yeah. Um, and I know you know I have an answer. Of course you do. <laughs> uh, it is not that we didn't know uh, about Spanish Florida, because we did. And um, the 1619 Project is not a history of slavery in the Americas. Mm -hmm. It is not a history of slavery in North America. Mm -hmm. It is a project looking at uh, the legacy of slavery in what will become the United States. Mm -hmm. And the foundation of the United States was 13 colonies. Mm -hmm. And by the time Florida gets admitted to the United States, we have been a country for nearly 100 years, 50, 60 years, 20 years before the Civil War. Um, so we had our, I think that it, it wouldn't make sense to start the story of America and American slavery with a colony that was under uh, the rule of the Spanish mm -hmm. that did not impact our founding legal system, political system, uh, social system, but instead was brought into an existing structure. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really why it was. This project was, and and I, I do hope that uh, the expansion of the project will speak to the diaspora. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to speak about Haiti. I, I want to see a piece that is connecting, you know, the Louisiana Purchase to. Um, uh, black Haitians becoming the first people in the history of the world to overthrow their masters, right? right? Absolutely. Um, that helps bankrupt Napoleon and makes them have to offload um, uh, the Louisiana territory to us and allows us to expand slavery. So I, I do want to speak to that diaspora. But to me, what was important is that this was a story about how America, uh, from this moment, um, comes to be the America that we know. Mm -hmm. And that begins in uh, Virginia, or, uh, yeah, in the 13 colonies. That's well, the argument. But I'm glad you're thinking about, the, 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 they now have a, a major contract from Random House, the publicist says um, a book. And I'm glad you're gonna add that information. Yes. Because it turned out, the relationship. I do wish we had put it, sorry. I do wish we had put it in, um, if you guys saw the project, we had a broadsheet. Yeah. And the broadsheet was about the, the history mm -hmm. as opposed to the modern legacy. And I went back and double checked because in my head I actually thought we mentioned uh, Spanish Florida in the broadsheet, but we did not. No, you didn't. And I wish that we, I do wish we had done that. The first thing I We looked, actually went all the way back to uh, uh, Angola, right. but we didn't mention uh, Spanish Florida. Yeah. The, uh, and it turns out they were very important because the biggest slave rebellion in the United States um, up to its time was the Stono Rebellion yes. in 1739. And that's in South Carolina. Why is it important? Well, it was mentioned they were Catholics because they were from Angola. They had military skills, and they were heading south. Right. The irony is the first Underground Railroad did not run from the uh, south to the north. It ran from the north to the south. It ran from the British colonies Spanish. across the St. Mary's River to Spanish Florida. And the Spanish were very clever. They go, if you slaves could cross over into Florida, um, 
become members of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, serve in the militia, right, uh, uh, pledge fealty to the king, then you could be free. Yes. And those guys in um, South Carolina were trying to get, like, <laughs> doing all they could to cross the St. Mary's River uh, into yes. Florida. So they were aware of each other, and it, it's all part of the same thing. So I'm really glad. Yes. Um, I'm really glad that you're doing that. And I'm also glad that uh, there's one little uh, sidebar about Queen and Zynga, which is like we're representing <laughs> Queen and Zynga like she was Harriet Tubman. Queen and Zynga was, according to Linda Haywood, was responsible for selling 50,000 Africans to Europeans to be shipped to the New World. But that was published as a correction. Uh, yes. Too. On my intervention, I wrote to Dean, and I go, Dean, whoa, <laughs> I love this issue, but you got to correct two things, and that's one thing that has to be corrected. And fortunately, that was they did that was done. But the biggest shock or surprise in creating this, and then we'll talk about some of the reception. What's my biggest surprise? Yeah. What is the biggest surprise? When did it come out? How many months have we had? August eighteenth. Okay. So this Online is on the 15th. So this is almost Christmas. Mm -hmm. What is the biggest, the biggest positive shock and the biggest disappointment? Uh, and, and there's a little water here for you. Thank you. I thought it was going to be some bourbon. Um, <laughs> That's a <at> dinner. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the biggest surprise has been the response. I mean, never, and I'm, you know, I don't. I don't like to use stupid analogies, never in a million years, but that's trite. But I just never expected uh, people would respond to the project in this way. Um, no, you tapped the zeitgeist. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I mean, I, I knew it was important, and I hoped that it was powerful. I believed that it was powerful. The first time um, we laid the whole magazine out on the wall, like I, I broke down sobbing in the newsroom. Uh, um, that's beautiful. It was a little embarrassing because, you know, I, as a journalist, you don't, you don't do that. But it, plus, I also was exhausted, so it might have been part of that. <laughs> but, um, but I just, when I saw it all, I was like, wh what we've made, is, it, it is something important. But uh, as you also, I'm sure, know, you can do work that you think is very important, and no one cares. It goes out into the world, and uh, with all the competing things that people want to read or see or care about, and this is like some of the heaviest, hardest uh, history and, and storytelling that you can imagine, um, you just, it would not have been, it would not, it would have hurt me, uh, but it would have not surprised me if it received a tepid response. Mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> well, you didn't have that. That did not happen. <laughs> uh, and it's been, you know, the, the number of schools that are teaching it, um, the number of uh, college professors who messaged me and were like, I've torn up my uh, syllabus and I'm, you know, inserting this in the syllabus. I, I've been, you know, I'm in Newark in uh, a very poor black high school where they put on a three-hour presentation where these kids wrote original essays and created original dance and wrote poetry responding to it and saying, like, we, we've never felt dignified by our history before mm -hmm. um, and, and able to draw the connections to their daily lives. Like, I, I just never would have, I, I never imagined that, that uh, I was in New Orleans and a 95-year-old black woman came up and hugged me and thanked me. <laughs> and I'm like, like I, I can't even imagine the things that you've lived through and you've seen that allow someone like me to even create something like this. Like I owe gratitude to her, but this sense of gratitude um, that so many um, regular black people have expressed. Uh, I don't know if you saw some of the videos, but like, you know, we sold out all over the country. Mm -hmm. uh, we still have um, 30,000 people on a waiting list right now. Hmm. Someone even like looked up my address and wrote me a hate letter to my house because they couldn't get a copy, <laughs> which I both loved and hated at the same right. time. Yeah. Um, That's creepy, yeah. It's a little, I mean, I'm a journalist, so I'm like, I understand my address is public record, but don't do that. Uh, and they didn't even leave a return address. I would have sent them a copy had they <laughs> not sent me hate mail without a return address. So that, that's been really uh, shocking. Uh, disappointing. I I don't know. I, I think you know the conservative backlash was also expected. I think what's probably been most disappointing uh, is like in the last few weeks there's been a couple uh, esteemed historians who I don't think I mean one of them admitted didn't closely read the project mm -hmm. who have tried to um, discredit the entire project mm -hmm. and I think 
that's been disappointing. And I had to like pull myself off of Twitter because uh, I was reacting in an emotional way to people just so casually dismissing something that yeah. we all worked so hard on and that was so powerful and important to me. And it's not that I ever thought that this project would be above criticism as we were talking about all, like history is always being rewritten and contested and debated. I mean, that's what I love about it. And uh, I fully expected a lot of people would not agree with, you know, we're, uh, we're not writing history. To, we're journalists who are writing essays and making an argument and using very sharp language and uh, not necessarily relying on all the nuance that uh, people in history would do. Mm -hmm. But to have people uh, just so flippantly discredit uh, mm -hmm. the work in that way, but people whose uh, words really matter, mm -hmm. that people really esteem, mm -hmm. uh, that's been disappointing. And I actually wish, you know, any of them had contacted me or uh, tried to actually engage in a real conversation as opposed to just doing that. Yeah. Um, it's good to write when you're angry. That's good. That's therapeutic. <laughs> but not to hit the send button. Yeah. No. <laughs> go to I, sleep. Was getting, I was getting calls like, you need to get off Twitter. So. Yeah, go, go to sleep. <laughs> go to sleep and then wake up and think, thank God I did not send that last thing. Yeah, I'm an Aries, so it's hard. Cause yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about the reaction, um, positively and negatively. Newt Gingrich. My proudest moment. <laughs> Said this, and I quote, I think slavery is a terrible thing. I, I think putting slavery in context is important. Glad he could admit that. <laughs> we still have sa slavery in places around the world today, which is absolutely right. So we recognize this as an ongoing story. Um, he went on and added, certainly if you're an African American, slavery is at the center of what you see as the American experience. But for most Americans, most of the time, there were a lot of other things <laughs> going on. There were several hundred thousand white Americans, it was absolutely the case, who died in the Civil War in order to free the slaves. Unquote. How do you react to that? Without mocking New Gingrich. Okay. Just the I mean, because the one sentiments of the things, are oft repeated, it, so yeah. It, but if I'm, I may, I've noticed, <clears throat> I haven't spent time analyzing 10,000 letters about this, but I have noticed certain light light motifs. And we'll get to one from, from uh, James McPherson in a minute. But the, the thing that's similar is that they're saying, what about the good white people? Yes. And what, one of my heroes is Charles Sumner. Mm -hmm. He was, in retrospect, the Bobby Kennedy of, of the Senate. He was the man responsible for the 1875 Civil Rights Movement. He believed in social equality when the, all kind of white abolitionists did not believe in social equality. Social equality meant yes. you could marry who you yes. want and you know, he believed in school integration. He's he, in the book he, I'm working he, on. He believed in that. He was, yes. he was the man. There were amazingly liberal white people in the history of who fought against slavery. And in England, Wilberforce, a lot of people with no obvious motivation other than uh, their conscience, morality, mm -hmm. ethics. So from G Gingrich, let's take it as a serious. Um, and Ralph Ellison, by the way, went to Memorial Church right here in Harvard Yard and wrote a beautiful essay when uh, he stood there looking at the names of the war dead. And he said these people, all white, of course, gave their lives um, so that he could be free and one day, obviously, write in, Invisible Man. And it's a very moving essay that he wrote. 750,000 uh, human beings, mostly men, died in the American Civil War. Mm -hmm. So slightly, I think, uh, you'd have to fact check me, but I think slightly more of those 750,000 um, died on the, for the Union cause than for the Confederate cause. But there's a whole lot of people who ended up dying so that you and I could be here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So how do you respond to that? Okay, so <laughs> this is what I'll say. And uh, when I think about uh, were there areas of the project that I wish we had provided uh, more of, more context, more nuance? I think that that's one. Mm -hmm. I think in my essay, uh, I could have uh, definitely talked more about white abolitionists and, and the white, not the white abolitionists who wanted to uh, send us somewhere else right. afterwards or 
Well, I should, I would I guess I would have had to talk about all of that, right? That yeah. one we know so many abolitionists. Being abolitionist does not mean that you believe in equality, which is why you brought up Charles yeah. Sumner because yes. many of them actually opposed black equality and dropped us like a bad habit as soon as freedom came. Well, and if I may um, hold that thought, just for the students, the first chapter of my book about Reconstruction is called Anti-Slavery, Anti-Slave. Right. It was a there was a complete a, a major difference between being against the institution of slavery and believing black people were equal to white yes. people. They had, one was an economic institution. That's why Lerone Bennett went nuts when he found out Abraham Lincoln's, uh, let's say, evolution in attitudes about mm -hmm. African Americans. Because mm -hmm. he was a staunch anti-slavery person who for a long time used the N-word. And as you know, um, about a month, just over a month before the preliminary emancipation was shared with the cabinet, met with black ministers in Washington mm -hmm. and asked them to lead a movement of the, the free Negroes out of the country because the presence of black and white people was totally incompatible. So, you know, he's a great emancipator, but he, he evolved and he got to know Frederick Douglass and fell in love with the 200,000 black men who basically saved the Union yes. by, by fighting um, for, for the Northern cause through the Navy and the army and in his last speech which actually led to his death he said he wanted to give them and the very intelligent negroes yeah. the right to, right yeah. to vote so you can see the complexity yes. even there but anyway end of parenthesis go ahead well so again so yes i i think that that is a valid criticism mm -hmm. um the we didn't give white people enough credit argument um though i wouldn't say, you know, most of the white folks who were fighting in the Civil War were not fighting to end slavery. And I don't see giving you credit for fighting to end an institution that you created. Mm -hmm. That's just the way that I think about it. And it also, of course, uh, ignores the fact that black folks were fighting to end slavery. Mm -hmm. And a lot of black folks died too. Uh, to save a nation that would force them back into quasi-slavery uh, less than 12 years later. Mm -hmm. So. So I guess what, I, what I, my argument, what I would say is I think that is a valid criticism, but I also think we have had uh, plenty of stories in 400 years about white heroism. Mm -hmm. And we have given outsized attention to what we consider good white people. Abraham Lincoln is a great emancipator, mm -hmm. right? These stories of like the good white folks. Uh, this was a bottom-up history about the people who never get credit for any of this. Mm -hmm. um, who were self-liberating, mm -hmm. who were not waiting around for white people to fight some war and liberate them. So yes, I, I think that is a valid criticism, um, but I also know that very intentionally we were creating a counter-narrative that was not yet again going to center white people. And I think it was important not to give white people that escape when they were reading this, mm -hmm. which is I will identify mm -hmm. with Charles Sumner. That mm -hmm. would have been me. Mm -hmm. The masses of people were never Charles Sumner. Mm -hmm. And the masses of no, people never true. believed in black liberation or equality. And I didn't want that out. But of course, it then leaves you open, excuse me, open to this type of criticism. Mm -hmm. um, but again, these were essays making an argument. And I think a lot of people forget that uh, we were not trying to write the history of the Civil War. I probably spent eight paragraphs and 8,000 words on the Civil War because I was making an argument about, about black people and democracy. Um, the slavery argument. To me, it, it, it's, uh, it's belittling and degrading to say, why are you focusing on uh, the atrocity of chattel, heritable, uh, legal, racialized slavery, the largest forced migration in the history of the world, uh, because there's people practicing slavery right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, that's insulting. And I'm, mm -hmm. I, I won't even address that as a proper critique. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that, that's my response to that. I think when I'm thinking about uh, my essay that will, so the book is expanding the project. So everything that was in the magazine will be in the book. And then we're expanding essays. There are certainly things three and a half, three months out that I would change about the essay. And mm -hmm. I do think I want to add, you know, you think about someone like a John Brown. You mm -hmm. think about uh, William Lloyd Garrison. You sure. think about these very rare white people who actually believed in like true equality. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that is important to give a nod to that. But well, just trust the balance is going to be most abolitionists abandon us at the moment of uh, of freedom. So. Right after that, with the collapse yes. of Reconstruction, it is we weren't a, supposed to be here, right? No, as you know, it is a very complicated story. I've yeah. spent the last two years marveling in an, a deeply uncomfortable way at 
well, the positive, glorious things black people achieved under Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. with, with help from their what, white allies. Absolutely. With, Couldn't have done it without it. Without it. 2,000 black men elected uh, in the South. 80% of all eligible black men, 80% <coughs> of all eligible black men in 10 of the 11 Confederate states registered to vote in the first freedom summer of 1867. It's mind boggling. It's mind boggling. And in 1868, you know what? They elected the President of the United States yes. with a popular vote. Ulysses S. Grant won overwhelmingly in the Electoral College, but he only won the popular vote by 300,000 votes. 500,000 black men voted for Ulysses S. Grant. And 99% of those who had been enslaved couldn't read and write mm -hmm. unless they miraculously learned <laughs> in, in three, right, years, three years, two years after the end of slavery because it was illegal to teach um, an enslaved person to read and write. So we elected 16 black men to Congress, including, including two United States senators. And by 1901, that number had risen to 22. And then George Henry White, kicked out, there wouldn't be another um, black person elected to Congress from Chicago till 1929. There were, I could go on and on about the triumphs, but it only lasted 12 years. And when the Supreme Court, which totally abandoned yes. our ancestors and threw them under the bus after um, the slaughterhouse cases, Crookshank, and then in 1883, what's called the civil rights cases, mm -hmm. declared the 1875 Uncle. Civil Rights Act unconstitutional, and then solidified separate but equal as a law of the land in Plessy v. Ferguson, 1896. We were abandoned. Yes. And state constitutions starting in 1890 in each of the former Confederate states. These are a group of people who had declared war on the United States mm -hmm. of America. They had separate constitutional conventions. They couldn't get rid of the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment to the Constitution, but they could circumvent them through state constitutions. And so they figured out how to disenfranchise black men. Why? Because the, in South Carolina, Mississippi, and uh, Louisiana, black people were a majority. And in Georgia, Georgia, Alabama, and Florida, a majority of the population. Let this sink in. And in Georgia, Alabama, and Florida, almost a majority yeah. in, the, in the 40%. That's a mini black republic. And if they could continue to vote, that meant power real power and they said that could not stand and our former allies in the north a lot turned a blind eye you can use whatever however you want to romanticize it the country united uh, explicitly or implicitly to take away our ancestors rights beginning just a few years after the end of the Civil War that is scandalous the rise and fall of reconstruction is one of the most important things that Americans need to understand, and particularly black Americans, because as Eric Foner, my dear friend, says, the rights that you think are guaranteed and are inviolable yes. can be snatched right. away. Like what? Like a woman's right to control her body. Yes, you know, like the right to vote itself. Voter suppression. We have been here before, and that's why this history is important. But I'm glad that you're, um, because it obviously drove a lot of people crazy. James McPherson, I got a letter from him today, not about you, but about we'd invite him to come to give um, the Huggins lectures. And he's one of the emeritus deans of Civil War historians, a great historian. And he was recently asked about your project, as you know, and, and his response made waves. Here's what he said. Almost from the outset, I was disturbed by what seemed like a very unbalanced one-sided account, which lacked context and perspective on the complexity of slavery, which was clearly, obviously, not an exclusively American institution, but existed throughout history and slavery in the United States was only a small part of a larger world process that unfolded over many centuries. And in the United States, too, there was not only slavery, but also an anti-slavery moment, which is the theme we're dwelling on now. So I thought the account, which emphasized American racism, which is obviously a major part of the history, don't question about it, but it focused so narrowly on that part of the story that it left most of the history um, out. So, what about the parallel tradition in history of abolitionism and anti-racism that Professor McPherson cited? You only had so much space, but you had more space in the book. So tell us about your, your approach in deciding. You've talked about how you decide what to include in the mag. What are you going to include in the book? 
So let, let's just start by saying, uh, I think the only essay that McPherson, or McPherson read was mine. Mm -hmm. and by the way, I say McPherson, and I've been corrected, yeah, so I don't I, know what I said McPherson and got corrected, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, but the, and, and he says at the top of that interview, I read a few essays and then skimmed the rest because I wasn't learning anything new. Yeah. So take the critique with, with that. Though we've already discussed that, clearly we don't talk a lot about abolition. Again, so he's a Civil War historian. In his book, how much does he talk about the civil wars of other nations? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Serious question. She's, I think, she's ready for this question. Right. Okay. I, of course I am, because <laughs> I've Unlike been, him, you read his <laughs> right, work. Exactly. <laughs> so this <laughs> argument that as a Civil War scholar, somehow uh, that I'm not talking about all the slavery that existed in the world about a project assessing the modern legacy of slavery in the United States is a ludicrous argument to make. And to me, again, it's insulting. I don't need to talk about every other slavery that existed. I'm talking about slavery that was in a country founded on the individual and inalienable rights of men. Mm -hmm. How many of those other countries had a declaration that we can all say from memory, right? We hold these truths to be self-evident, right. right. that all men are created equal, endowed by the creator of inalienable rights. Mm -hmm. So to make that argument, I, I actually don't, like I would love to sit across the table from him and ask him, no, I didn't talk about slavery everywhere else. I talked about slavery in this country's assessment of this legacy. And no one would expect that he would do a survey of every civil war that ever existed before sure. the American Civil War to write about the American Civil War. You write about the context in America uh, that led to that civil war. And if you were trying to write about the history of slavery, right. slavery is as old as humanity. Absolutely. It is as old as civilization. Africans enslaved each other, enslaved each other in wars that sold them to white people to come to the United States. Yes. Every society had slavery. There are no innocents. But in what's also telling, right, is we want to be exceptional in every way but that. Mm -hmm. So we are exceptional. We are exceptional. You hear all day long. Except when it comes to slavery, everybody did it. <laughs> so we are exceptional in the <laughs> hypocrisy of that, but you can't make the That's argument. That's actually very funny. Thank you. And it's, <laughs> but it's true, right? And, and this is, this is, I just think that that argument uh, is, is dismissive, and especially from someone who's made their life around the study of these very things. He understands why I didn't talk about slavery everywhere else. Mm -hmm. He's just trying to dismiss the project. And again, this is not a history. Mm -hmm. My essay was an argument about how black people were the perfectors of this democracy. Mm -hmm. And there are all kinds of things I could have written about, but mm -hmm. if they didn't have anything to do with my argument, that is the nature of essay. Of that course. is the nature of rhetoric. I wish people would stop pretending that they think, like, I am not a historian at Harvard who is writing a scholarly paper. Mm -hmm. I am a journalist who is writing an essay to make an argument that I made very clear in the first five paragraphs of the piece, and that is the facts that I garner from my argument. So you can say what you want about that, but we did not pretend. I mean, if you read the first page of the magazine, we say exactly what we're doing. We're very explicit. Mm -hmm. We are reframing American history. We are centering the contributions of black Americans and arguing that our true founding was not 1776, but 1619, and here's why. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes and pretend that we're doing anything other than what we were doing. Mm -hmm. So to make that critique, I think, is it's just not in good faith. The um, W.E.B. Du Bois, of course, is the... First he critiqued me too. Because <laughs> I read Black Reconstruction, uh, damn it. <laughs> haven't you read the paper for tomorrow yet? <laughs> W.E.B. Du Bois, um, since we're live streaming, um, first African American, got a PhD in the history of Harvard, graduated from Historical Black Fisk University in 1888, and took three degrees from Harvard an A.B. in 1890, an A.M. in 1891, 1895, got his uh, Ph.D. Uh, in the history department. And then in 1935 published one of the most important books in the history of American history, which is Black Reconstruction. Du Bois famously, and, and he has an essay in Black Reconstruction. It's called The Propaganda of History. I was just thinking, yep. It's uh, my, one of my mentors at Yale. Uh, John Blaskin made me read the, the I, had, had to re I had to read Black Reconstruction for an undergraduate course. And then Blaskin made me reread the <laughs> propaganda of history. Um, 
So I wonder whether you might talk about the relationship between propaganda and history. We've talked about the relationship between journalism and mm. scholarship, or as it were, journalism and history. Let's talk about the relationship between propaganda and history. How did you see your project as pushing back on the former and advancing the latter? And did you worry that there might be any risks in offering an alternative to 1776 as potent as 1619? Uh, yeah, such great questions. Uh, so that's one of my favorite chapters in the book. I actually quote it in the book that I'm writing. And it's amazing. It's such a great, so what's been interesting uh, in the last few weeks as uh, McPherson, and Oaks, uh, and Wood have come out against the project has been uh, how many people actually don't understand how history works and the study of history. Mm -hmm. uh, so what people have said is uh, history is objective and you are subjectively rewriting it. Not understanding, one, that of course history has never been objective. Um, and that history is not stenography. It's not merely these are the facts and dates and these are the people who did it, but it is us trying to interpret those mm -hmm. actions. And or, that, or a video camera. Right. Right. But even then, right? You'd have to edit. Rodney King. Which angle? <laughs> I see police brutality, you see resisting, right? Mm -hmm. Like this is, this is, this is the, the nature of this work is that it will be rewritten, it will be uh, contested, and it will be debated. Um, but at the same time, uh, so much of the way that we have been taught about this has been propaganda. Mm -hmm. It has been to downplay, you know, the fact that uh, people are shocked that um, slavery was profitable. <laughs> That's not logical. <laughs> I almost choked. But people swapping. are literally <laughs> shocked by this, right? Because well, why did they think the slavery history, existed? <laughs> the, the history was taught that this was. We've been taught this was a backwards system and that enslaved labor could not compete with free labor and that the South was pre-modern. Mm -hmm. And so we have come to believe somehow um, large segments of the population that slavery was not profitable. And why we enslaved black folks, there's not really a good definition, right, mm -hmm. um, if you don't address profit. But what you realize is all of this has been the intentional way that we have been taught mm -hmm. or not taught about slavery at all. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting to me is the scholars who are so worried about uh, 1619 curriculum going into schools. I wish I would have seen these letters and concerns about the way our children are being taught about slavery right now. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that I had people send me uh, copies of their kids' textbooks. We're called immigrant workers. Oh, no. Right? We're uh, simply a, a, we were just a source of labor. Mm. Um, we're not taught, you know, some of these, it's literally three paragraphs that show you a map of the trade and human beings were traded for molasses and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, where was the concern there about what that propaganda is? That people are making intentional decisions, uh, what they would teach us, how much they would teach us, um, how really much more about omission. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the Dunning School, which, mm -hmm. It's oh. part of our national reunification is that we will pretend that slavery was marginal and we will just move past it. And that African Americans were incompetent. Yes. Um, during Reconstruction. It, well, it's, Did not right. deserve Reconstruction the, becomes the justification for Jim Crow that follows. Absolutely. Because we let these black people rule and, and they were out of control. They, they were, were venal. They were out of control. They, they were, were stupid. Right. You know. Black people cannot self-govern. No. So they deserve to go back into slavery. It's why I mean. Too much too soon. Yes. Too and, much. And it wasn't their fault. God made them that way. Well, <laughs> or, or the other argument that sl slavery had so corrupted us that it's not that we were inferior, but we just needed time to come right. to our humanity after, you know, the paternalism of slavery. And so metaphors of childhood. It was, yes. We, we were the, the, the childhood of the humanity. Yes. Our ancestors. And slowly, we, maybe in 100 years, we'd reach adolescence. <laughs> and yet you it's had horrible. to create really all of these nasty. laws to keep us from resisting and fighting back and right. to keep us from voting because we were childish. You don't have to control yeah. children in that way. Right. Um, so when you understand, I mean, Du Bois writes about how his publisher didn't even want him to publish the book Black Reconstruction. Right. And it was this understanding that if you teach Reconstruction, then it gives lie to the entire narrative we've told ourselves was that all this was inevitable. 
Reconstruction mm -hmm. shows that it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Reconstruction shows we could have gone on a different course. Completely different. We could have been a biracial, multiracial democracy. Like we could have done something different. We chose, as always, white supremacy, and so we have to not teach about this 12 year period. At Reconstruction all. was America's first experiment with in, in, uh, interracial democracy. Absolutely. And it was a gla grand and glorious. It's an uh, amazing time. And it could have been the beginning. If you coupled that with land redistribution, 40 acres and a mule, the whole America that we're living in today would can't even imagine an alternate universe. It's an amazing thought exercise to try to figure out what yeah. we could have been uh, had we stuck with it, mm -hmm. but we were never going to stick with it. I have a well, one, maybe one and a half more questions. Then, if it's okay, we'll open it up. Okay. Um, Abby, how are we doing on time? One of the things. Five more hours. <laughs> I mentioned this in a very nice exchange with the editor of the magazine uh, just a couple days ago. I said, one of the things you might think of is what academics do mm. when you go for the book, which is you take the penultimate version of the manuscript and send it to people you know will disagree with you. Yes. Ask them to do reader's reports. The three people you named are people I know and admire. They're great scholars. They um, I happen to disagree with them about their interpretation of your essay, but they're, they're serious scholars. McPherson, Wood, and Oakes. One of the things you might do is send them the manuscript. What do you lose? And you go, I will ask you, or pay them to do reader's reports. This is what, for the, again, students, this is how all academic books are published. The publisher, you submit a manuscript to Harvard University Press. Then they send it to two readers, anonymous. I mean, you do not know their identity. And they could say, this is the stupidest idea ever. I mean, you read the reader's report, you want to kill somebody. You know, you try to look through the pattern. I recognize the type. In the back in the old days, you wrote that reader's report, Alejandro, and I'm going to kick your butt. You wait till they send me yours. You ain't lying. But you know what? After you get over getting your feelings hurt, that's the first day, and then being pissed off, they didn't understand the genius, <laughs> the subtlety. Then you go, you know what? Maybe there's something there yeah. that I could. I would encourage you to do that because what's it take? That would be what's to it take? Lose Dialogue. my pettiness right now. <laughs> or you know, invite um, McPherson to lunch. Go and talk to him one on one. This is colloquy. This is what yes. the academy is based on. This is the best of the academy. Not circulating letters signed by academics trying to kill your project, but actually in engaging in in an intellectual discussion. Why did you do certain things? Oh, and then you go, well, this is why I did it. And, well, maybe I'll think about that. Well, sir, I didn't really want to tell this. I was trying to tell this other story. Try it. It only slows you down a little bit, and I think that what you can gain and what they can gain could be worthwhile. It's so you just, could, like, this you is could a, be like the intermediary. Yeah, I can hook, them, I can hook you up with them. I'll call them on that <laughs> phone. <laughs> okay, final question, and then I will yield. I know it's very difficult for me to do that, <laughs> but I will yield to the floor. Um, what about this history remains unresolved for you? Any questions about the history of race in America or the history of black people in America, the role of slavery in America, however you might want to put it, are there any questions that still linger? Oh God, like a million. I mean, every time I read uh, another book and then you go look at the footnotes or the end notes you realize everything that you still don't know mm -hmm. and that uh, learning and, and thinking about this will be a lifelong journey which is actually very exciting it is. Uh, for me and I, I think that was I mean this is what excites me about the expansion is uh, we put out what I thought were the best ideas and now people having read it you know, maybe even you um, <laughs> Now we've put the call out again, and we're like, okay, now re having read the conceit, do you have an idea? Mm -hmm. And uh, the ideas that people have coming in, um, that the modern connections that other very, very smart people are making that I hadn't thought about mm -hmm. is like amazing and beautiful and it's exciting to me. Um, uh, I don't want to say the scholar, but some uh, a, a scholar, uh, I talked to her yesterday about Second Amendment mm -hmm. and her take on it blew my mind. Mm -hmm. And if it blows my mind, it's going to blow, you know, the average reader's mind. Explain so. to our students about the Second Amendment. They probably, for a thousand dollars, couldn't tell you what's in the Second Amendment. Well, you know, the Second Amendment is about gun ownership, mm -hmm. uh, the right to bear arms, um, but also has, you know, as 
almost everything, so I'm linked to slavery, uh, which of course is my argument. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think I'm just excited about all the ways that it can expand, and, and I feel like so tremendously lucky every day that you know, my job pays me to read and think uh, and and write. Um, I mine too. Right, like it's, it's amazing. A, it is. It's, it's like it's dying a, to go to heaven. It's the most luxurious. <laughs> it's just it's just a beautiful. Not a lot of people uh, have the luxury, and even particularly in my in my craft, um, you know, most journalists are having to produce a lot and often, and I get to like just sit and read and like ruminate on things, uh, which I think is great. Well, the second part of your question. Um, what li what haunts you? Oh, what haunts me. Uh, and I'm working on it right now, so hopefully it won't haunt me for long, is uh, the project doesn't talk about reparations. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was originally supposed to, we just couldn't, uh, the essay was assigned, it didn't, it didn't work out, and that's probably like the ancestors' divine intervention that I was meant to write the essay on reparations, because right. that's what I'm gonna do. But I think, you know, you can't read the whole project and not come away. I mean, I do think part of the reaction, at least from the right to this project, has been that it's in the New York Times and you can't read the whole thing and not come away with the understanding that something is owed. Right. Um, that because it is not a history, because we're saying look across modern American life, look across like how people are having to live right now, um, and we can link it directly to slavery, uh, there needs to be a very strong essay on um, what is owed and, and how we would do it. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest what, you didn't ask me, but in addition to um, Esteban, the first black man who you know comes here and he's a free black conquistador, um, Linda Haywood, when she pub you published that letter of correction about yes. Queen and Zynga, to talk about the African role in the slave trade. This is something black people don't want to talk about. But according to John Thornton and Linda Hay Haywood, 90% of the Africans who ended up here were the victims of imperial wars, uh, wars between imperial states in Africa, when Africans were capturing Af Africans and selling them to Europeans along the coast. This is something, this has got to be full disclosure, and we have to talk about that. That doesn't change. That's going to be your project. <laughs> that, that, that doesn't change anything about the evils <laughs> of slavery yeah. or the merits of reparations or whatever, but it is something that many of us are, I, I always talk about it and always get in trouble. In all my films, I talk about it. In my work, I talk about it because it's just a fact. It is. It's just a fact. And Africans are just as screwed up or, or as noble or as human. Use whatever adjective you want. And this is African elites, not like normal Africans, but African states are engaging in wars sometimes to specifically capture other people we would call Africans that they wouldn't have they called were not, Africans. They were, right, they were not their own people. People of other right. ethnic groups. And then sell them to Europeans in forts along the coast. And they, 12.5 million, 12.5 million were shipped across the ocean. Yes. 15% die in the slave trade. It's very important not to be politically correct, but to be honest about that. Because it doesn't take away the arguments for reparations or the, the heinous nature of slavery in the New World, which was obviously different than it was in Africa. So I would encourage you to do that. So I, I mean, on, to that point, I would be interested then. Um, and how you think, like what's the modern, because uh, again, the, 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 the magazine had a very particular conceit for a reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am open to any and all uh, essays. Like I, I can very easily see the essay about Haiti because you can look at uh, oh my God. our immigration policy now and why so many uh, Haitians have had to immigrate here, right? Sure. You can direct, directly link that to American intervention uh, and, and going all the way back to us punishing them for uh, overthrowing the French. Um, but so, you know, if, if you want to talk and you have an, a conceit that would match that, where we're looking at some modern thing that's surprising, mm -hmm. that we can trace back to the African involvement in the slave trade, I absolutely would be happy to have an essay like that. Right. But this isn't, again, it's not, it's not a survey. No, of course of, not. Right, and it, it has well, to fit into the argument that we're making somehow. The reason I mention it um, is because of, um, <laughs> you had a, a feature on Queen Nzinga. Yes, but the, the that queen of the slave, different. the queen of the slave trade, and it may be that we, you know, that was the uh, historical broadsheet, and that one was a history. Right. So, yeah, there's certainly 
I mean, even in that area, I imagine if that broadsheet somehow goes in the book, we will have to expand on that. Oh, my clearly, God, yes, because right? that's like, one, you'll she, haunt was us not, if we she was, don't. She was the anti Harriet Tubman. <laughs> <laughs> I might make a movie about that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I think in the history, that can certainly be addressed. I'm talking about yes. even in a paragraph, not I, I in a whole you. article. I got you. I give you my word. Okay, you got it. Because as a scholar yes. and a person who loves truth, that's just a fact. And we don't lose anything. We, in fact, I agree. we get accused of trying to. I was going to say, it, it is that type of thing where uh, by not including a simple paragraph, you allow people to detract say, and discredit from the larger project. Right. So and it, and I, it's, I agree. And it's, it, it's always a um, mistake. Absolutely. And one, one of the curious things about Haiti is that, and this is a small thing, but again, it's related to the Louisiana Purchase, which right. you, my, nobody told me. We all, you learn about I'm 69, but uh, years old, we all had to learn about the Louisiana Purchase. Nobody yeah. told anybody my age that it was because Napoleon ran out of money because yep. the Haitians had kicked his armies behind and had fought the first uh, successful revolt against their masters in the, the history of, of written memory, in the history yep. of civilization. And when... Um, uh, by 1809, because of the Napoleonic Wars in, in Europe, the people, fl black people, some free, some enslaved, some white people who had slaves, mm -hmm. fred, fled from the island of San Domingue, as it was called, and went to Cuba. Yes. Then because of a change of regime in, in, <laughs> in the Napoleonic Wars, they were kicked out of Cuba. Where did they go? 1809. The black population in New Orleans doubled, yep. basically over, metaphorically overnight, because these people came, some were enslaved and some were free, and it's very, very complicated. But that just shows we were never taught that the Caribbean yes. was this little tiny place in communion. New Orleans to Havana, Jamaica, 50 miles from Cuba to Haiti, all these places and... and or even the British colonies, and that the, we were sure. part of... The British colonies that were also in the Caribbean. Yes. That South Carolina settled by white people in Barbados who need to expand slavery, right? right? Like, we're, we're not even taught how we're connected to even English colonies outside no. of the and, United and States. No, and the worst thing is that 10.8 million Africans, we now know from David Eltis and David Richardson, the Transatlantic Slave yes. Trade Database. Even the Times now uses 12.5 million Africans shipped to, to um, the New World. Of that 10.8 million, only 388,000 came, came to the United States. Uh -huh. A million went to Cuba. A million went to Jamaica. Five, 772,000 went to Haiti. Five million went to Brazil. Brazil, yeah. That's a, like a whole, that's a whole other special issue. But that, that's very, very important to, to talk yes. about that. Vastly and, outnumbering the white immigrants who came to the Americas, yes. which we're also not taught about. And when the slave trade was ended, J January 1st, 1808, and that when, when the Haitians refused to, <laughs> when they were freed, they go, I am, not, even for two Louverture, they said, I'm not going back on that sugar <laughs> plantation. Sugar plantation was a death machine. Yeah. You know, they had a seven-year lifespan, maybe. They said, we're not going to do that. The whole sugar industry, sugar was created uh, San Domingue as the jewel uh, in, of, uh, of the Antilles. It was one of the, the uh, greatest profit generations generating uh, industries in history. It just moved, it didn't disappear, it moved from Haiti to Cuba. And Cuba ends up then reinventing um, slavery, plantation economy, the sugar industry in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Slavery ended in Cuba, and uh, finally abolished in 1886, and in Brazil in 1888. We all were the third that, to the last. Huh? We were the third to the last. Yeah, and all of that, these interest men, these were capitalists. They were, the, what do you think they were going to do, go bankrupt? They just said, I'm going to another island. We're going to reinvent it. And the way, I, I, I thought it was very good, the way that you showed, there are people in Boston making money from um, slavery. Who controlled the spools? Yes. You know? Who's Where did the go, cotton come go, from? Go, go to Lowell. Yeah. Right. And little Irish girls, immigrant girls being underpaid, exploited. A girl, I use girls because they were girls, mm -hmm. young women. So the interstices of evil 
which arose out of these economic relationships. It's so complicated, and the stories that have been told us have been very, very partial. And what you're doing is contributing to um, a larger narrative. And I applaud you for doing Thank that. You. Let's give it up. Now, questions and comments? We have some historians in here. Oh, I know they're going to be jumping on I you. Know, don't grill me, man. <laughs> Skip, could you call people out? Yeah. Uh, what are we going to do, Matt? I'm just calling. Do you want to give them a microphone? How much time we have left, boss? We have 20 minutes of questions. Ch Charlie? They have a mic. You want to start with? Uh, I just wanted to thank you. No, uh, uh, introduce both. yourself. Oh. Uh, I'm Charlie Hyman. Uh, it's an honor to meet you. Uh, and you're a student. You. Identify yourself. Uh, all right. I'm a <laughs> recently graduated student okay. uh, who mm -hmm. made the trek and uh, to to come here uh, to hear from you. I wanted to ask, uh, well, about a thousand questions, but I'll stick to one. Um, your expansion of the 1619 project to schools. <laughs> Has there been any thought given to regionalizing it? Because when in, from Massachusetts, you know, I hear right. I mean, when, when I'm, fr I, I'm from Massachusetts, and I'm about to write this down. Uh, I, I it's a good idea. The the whole idea we we always hear about the only people from Massachusetts during the Civil War, as far as as far as we're concerned, are Robert Gould Shaw in the fifty fourth, right? Uh, right. Um, there, William Lloyd Garrison and Sumner. Right. I, if we get to Sumner. Uh, but I mean, the reason Cape Cod made any money was because we were shipping cod to feed slaves. Yes. And the, you know, I mean, they're, they're, we're starting to get, you know, fan, there's a movement to rename Faneuil Hall. They, they, we're starting to see some of this recognition. And you write about busing, so you know about Louise Day Hicks, and uh, you know, it, there's a complex history. But w with regard to slavery, it's made, you know, especially in the old, you know, I'm not sure what you can do for Montanans, but the, the, in Massachusetts, I find just a total ignorance. Yeah. And, and when, when you said, we don't want to give people an out to identify with Sumner, what I find especially distressing in our teaching of the Civil War is that, I I locally, is that we give everyone that out. And it's just not true. It's just not factually backed up by anything. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and I was just wondering if you had plans about that. Good. Thank you, Charlie. Then you, then you. So the answer is no, but I think that's a great idea, uh, which is why I just put it in my phone. Uh, <laughs> I think that's really important. I mean, we definitely touch on that, and I try to touch on that in my essay. And I say, you know, all the time, slavery was practiced in all 13 colonies. And uh, in New Jersey, there were still enslaved people until 1865. So what's What's fascinating to me, and again, like I, I, I'm, I'm always really fascinated just about the making of national memory. And this idea that we have that the North was the true heart of America, and somehow like Southerners aren't really representative of America, though you can look at where like the first presidents came from, right? Um, and we do that not just with slavery, but just the way we think about race in general and the way we think about culture in general. And that allows us then to have the sense of clean hands if our true identity as Americans mm -hmm. is the free North. Um, and so I do think those, you know, Boston was a slave market. I think it is important to draw those connections. But even that, so, because one of the pushback I've gotten is, well, at the revolution or right around the revolution, all these northern states start abolishing slavery. One is because they didn't depend on the type of labor-intensive agriculture that was expanding slavery. There weren't a lot of black folks uh, living in those places. But also, ending slavery did not mean you were ending the dependency on slavery. So banking systems. You look at Rhode Island. The, lar the rich second richest man in America was a Rhode Island slave trader named the Wolf who didn't own human beings. He was just responsible for sending the ships that brought them here. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at Harvard, right? What where did so much of the capital that built this institution and the Ivy League come from? Because uh, rich people and universities were holding collateral in enslaved bodies. And uh, I think to not You mean that Harvard <laughs> indirectly made money Imagine. from- Imagine. I am I heard y'all put a pebble up to market or something like that. Um, uh, <laughs> 
So I, I do think that it is important uh, to talk about that history. But, but I also think, you know, the 1619 Project cannot, is not designed to teach all of this history. No, you this can't is, do that. Right, it, no, it is, it is a, a, a work of journalism. And I am thankful that it's going into schools. What I hope that it will do is encourage teachers to feel empowered to supplement further the education and to actually work to regionalize. And maybe that's something the Pulitzer Center can, can help assist with. Of course. And you know, Eric Foner's History of America, to me, is the best one on, on, on the market. He happens to be a very good friend of mine. <laughs> but there are a lot of other histories. Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham's has completely rewritten John yes. L. Franklin's From Slavery to Freedom. There are other texts. And, and textbook. But here's an interesting fact. Um, you might not. I did not know this until we made the Reconstruction series and I wrote Stony the Road. Black men, as I said earlier, in 10 of the 11 Confederate states got the right to vote because of the first Reconstruction Act in the summer of 1867. Now, they were former slaves living in the South, right? And, and the free Negro population from the South. You, so you would think, oh, well, free black men in the oh. North mm -hmm. had the right to vote all along, right? Not everywhere. The only place black men, free Negroes, as we would have said, m males, could have voted before the um, 15th Amendment was five of the six New England states and New York if you had $250 worth of property. Yep. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, forget it. All, even West Virginia, where my family is from, which seceded from Virginia during the Civil War in 1863, did not give black men the right to vote. They only got the right to vote in the North, except for those exceptions. And in Connecticut, they refused to let black men vote until the ratification of the 15th Amendment in 1870. That's astonishing. That shows your point. That we, we, we were, uh, were um, raised on a binary between the yes. North and the South. There were, you know, so as it were, William Lloyd Garrison as opposed to George Wallace. It was infinitely more complicated than that. Yes. And that is a very important uh, didactic um, um, extension or implication of what, of what you're trying to do. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my Hi. name is Kyra March. I'm a sophomore at the college studying African-American studies and women and gender studies. Amen. And I just wanted to ask first, um, can you talk about your journey to becoming an investigative um, journalist and what advice you may have for people who may want to follow a similar path? And then also, you kind of answered my second question about how you wanted your project to relate to reparations. And I know um, Bernard Boxall has like an argument about like the, co the counterfactual argument for reparations and about how, um, like, basically he's asking, he's saying that, descendants of U.S. slaves still like are affected by the legacies of slavery and a lot of people try to dispute that so I also wanted to see like with your future project on reparations how do you how would you want to like how would you want to come into contact with those types of arguments what was the argument so like basically he has like <laughs> this kind of factual argument and he's saying that like the governments the governments um past slavery are still responsible for like not giving slaves reparations. And so he's saying that descendants of slaves are still owed those reparations because the legacies of slavery still exist. And so I know that your project talks about that a lot. And so I wanted to see like how you wanted to like come in contact with like philosophical, the philosophical argument and different things like that in your next project about mm -hmm. reparations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll try to be quick on uh, my journey. So. I grew up in a very working class household. Um, no one really on my dad's side went to college. My mom was first gen on her side. And uh, I got interested in, well, one, I was, you know, it's probably hard to believe, but very, very nerdy as a child. <laughs> uh, I read the news. I was an avid reader of the news from a very young age. My father, um, who just had a high school, actually didn't even have a high school diploma, but he went to the military, always ordered two newspapers. Uh, we subscribed to our daily paper and our state paper, and we would read the paper. And I think I got my first letter to the editor published in fifth or sixth grade. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> it was in response to a, a syndicated columnist who's still writing, who I thought wrote something racist. And I wrote a letter, and they actually published it. And I remember how uh, empowering that felt. <laughs> and 
uh, when I was in high school, the same uh, one black male teacher I ever had, I, um, I went in one day to him and I complained about our high school newspaper and that our high school newspaper never wrote about uh, the 20% of kids in school who were bused from uh, the black side of town and how you know we, we were bused, so we always felt like outsiders in our own school and it just felt like the paper was further representing that. And he told me to either join my high school paper or shut up and stop complaining about it. Um, <laughs> you know, as black folks do, we keep it real. It's just why you go to your black educators. <laughs> um, so I joined a paper and uh, won my very first award uh, from the Iowa High School Press Association about uh, a piece I did on the stereotypes that black kids face coming from uh, the east side, the black side of town. Um, and for the first time was seeing like my black classmates actually reading the paper, mm -hmm. right? And like actually engaging with it and... Uh, That's powerful. Yeah, seeing like, you know, I, the Freedom's Journal which said we, we wish to plead our own cause, no long should others speak for us. I didn't right. know that then because I, I hadn't uh, studied it, but it was that sense that uh, the power was in if, if you don't like the way that people are uh, either rendering you invisible or writing about you, then you have to write your own stories. Freedom Journal. Freedom's Journal was the first black newspaper published in the United States, uh, 4th of July, 1827. Yes. Um, this is so funny, like, I, I can't remember literally, like, what I did three days ago, but random black history facts, like, they're <laughs> all there. My husband's like, what's wrong with you? Like, uh, anyway, so that's what kind of got me thinking about journalism as a career, was being on my high school paper, which actually uh, makes me very sad because I spend so much time in poor black high schools with no newspapers and no yearbooks, and I'm like, how does a child like me imagine uh, a future for themselves like I had when you don't even get yeah. access to basic <laughs> things that you know most white kids get. Um, so from there to like becoming a investigative reporter, that part was really hard. Uh, I didn't have role models and certainly did not have a lot of uh, people in power in my newsrooms who looked at a uh, black woman like myself and thought they should invest in me doing project reporting and investigative reporting. Um, I kind of had to fight my way in like we often do. I paid for my own training. I set myself to trainings. My, I wrote for fellowships uh, and just started sneakily doing investigative projects on my own and then presenting them to my editor at the point of no return, which is uh, kind of what you have to do. I worked two jobs. I was 30 years old. Um, that was the first time where I ever made enough money where I could work one job. I was literally a uh, reporter by day and selling mattresses by night. Um, <laughs> I shouldn't have had to do that. Yeah. I, uh, at one point, was working part-time at Subway with a degree from Notre Dame mm. and uh, was selling mattresses with a master's degree. Mm. And, uh, of course, I'm grateful for that, though, because um, I think it is good to always be humbled. Mm -hmm. And I always would think about, I remember when I was working at Subway and how people would come in and talk to me Mm -hmm. and the assumptions they made about who I was and what type of person I was by the job I had and would always make me think about my grandmother who was a domestic and mm -hmm. who uh, was a janitor and washed mm -hmm. windows and people didn't think she was anything. So mm -hmm. I think it's part of the reason I'm a great reporter mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. I don't place a single bit of value in people's occupation or prestige. It doesn't mean a damn thing to me. Um, now I'm going off on a tangent, sorry. No, but, uh, it's, but, but, it's, basically, very but it's very moving. Yeah, very no moving. one... You know, I, come, I came from Waterloo, Iowa, and I'm a black woman who looks like this, and people did not take seriously that I could do important investigative reporting. And most of my career was a struggle to be able to not just do investigative reporting, but to be able to write about black folks. I was mm -hmm. told, you're pigeonholing yourself, you're biased, um, and nearly run out of the profession eight years ago. So it was really, uh, you know, the advice I give to all students, it's going to be hard. Most people aren't going to invest in you. Most people aren't going to believe in you. But the only thing you have is your excellence. You can't control anything outside of that, but you can only control yourself. Um, went to graduate school. Graduate school opened a lot of doors for me. Uh, I didn't realize how important networking was. I was very naive. I thought if you just worked hard and you know did a good job, it would get you into places. And real, then I realized that everybody gets jobs from knowing somebody. <laughs> so I had to make sure I started knowing somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just tried to do, you know, again, like really excellent work, not writing about, a lot of people write about race, just write about the problem. 
and they cite statistics. Here's a story about how black people are incarcerated higher than every other group. Here's a story about segregation. They're not writing stories that say, there's people responsible for this and we can prove how people are making actual decisions, right? Mm -hmm. They're not writing about an investigative way and that's the way that I saw those stories. Uh, so I forced myself in and I found uh, some allies along the way who were willing to invest in me but it's such a big reason why I helped co-found the Ida B. Wells Society for Investigative Reporting was understanding we did not have people in positions who were opening doors for us. Mm -hmm. We did not have people who saw someone like us and said, I'm going to invest in you. And if we kept waiting, really frankly, for white editors to do that, we were just going to keep waiting and we decided to, to do it for ourselves. And mm -hmm. I think my model in life is to try to be the person I needed when I was trying to make it. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Uh, <laughs> Oh. We have time for two more okay. questions. Especially Hello. Those long answers I'm giving. No, I'm sorry, your, your answers are great. It's been wonderful. Uh. Oh, me? Uh, hi, my name is Natalia Conde. I'm a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society um, at the law school. And one of the things that, um, first of all, I really appreciate your work, but one of the things that I've been really curious about is how are you how are you managing the online backlash because you and i actually got into a twitter fight we did yeah about a year ago but you unfollowed me i believe i did unfollow yeah you. i'm gonna follow you again <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that i loved about i can't that believe that <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that i loved about our fight was um it was us i felt like i was fighting with not a peer because you had a macarthur genius award i i don't but we were both we were both fighting about a love for black children yeah. right and it was so funny for me to see you attacked because i was like what are they doing to nicole hannah jones <laughs> they can't do that i'm a black woman she's in my family so i can do that and we can disagree and i felt very protective um, over you, particularly since you've released the work and I love the work, and how are you managing that? Because I look a lot in my own work about the harassment of black women yeah. online, um, and I, I would love to hear how you're managing it and offer any supports if I can, because that's something that I might not be a MacArthur genius, but I know things, you know. <laughs> to, <laughs> okay, to MacArthur offer. genius is, I don't want to say it's meaningless, but please don't. That, okay. Like literally, I, I, I don't even know what I did, just somebody called me one day and said I had it. So it's well, not anything that it. I, I, I mean, really There's did, always a future. <laughs> yes. If I were you, I would refriend her. What's exactly, because <laughs> you know, I know people now. Um, <laughs> thank you for the question though, and um, you know, let me just first say, anybody who engages on, particularly Twitter, knows that it is almost designed to have these just very harsh, like, non-nuanced interactions. Totally. And um, I think I, because I already run hot as it is, it's probably even worse for me. Uh, I have a very uh, quick temper in general. Ask my husband. Um, <laughs> So let me just say that. But in particular, when you are a black woman, you are at the intersection of like, you know, the two hatreds of this country, uh, race and gender. And so not only do you get constant uh, racist assaults, but then you get constant uh, misogynistic assaults. Mm -hmm. And it can be very hard. And my reaction is to try to like cut your kneecaps off. <laughs> but that's not, it's, it, it's, it's not good. And this is where, I mean, you know, I think three or four days ago, I actually was on Twitter and I was like, you know what, I, I've been engaging in a way that I don't think does me uh, mm -hmm. justice or my work mm -hmm. and apologize for that because I think you start going down these tit for tat rabbit holes mm -hmm. that become very easy to do and you wouldn't say these things if you were sitting across from this person. No. You could actually engage in a real dialogue and all the nuance and all the tone and like, you're snapping sometimes on people. It's like, actually, I was on your side, but you read it wrong. Um, right. So I, I think I'm trying to just pull back, and I just block a lot of people now, which is actually very liberating. I'm like, if you say something racist to me, you just don't even exist in my world. You'll never be able to say anything racist to me again because it's not necessary. Right. Um, but why bother reading all that stuff? Well, I the, never the, read the beauty, on Twitter. The beauty of it is, though, Please. I learn a lot when mm. I'm looking for something. So uh, for my book, I was like, I need a family who lived in Detroit in the 1970s, a white family who then moved to Growth Point, this particular suburb. Okay. And I put it on Twitter, and I found families. 
that I then interviewed. And oh. I don't know how I would have found this particular families. Or, okay. you know, when I That's wanted good. to do research for reparations, send me the best text that you have on this. And I right. get such, so it's useful. And it's also clearly useful for engaging with people who in good faith want to talk to you. No, it is. Um, people love that they'll tweet something to me or ask me a question and I'll respond. Right. That I'm not, you know, sitting at the New York Times above it all and I just write and put out into the world and you're not worthy of me engaging. But then, for all that's good, there's just so much shit. And people who love the fact that I took down a New York Times reporter and she responded. And, sure. and feeding into that is, is not smart. So well, I think I'm constantly yeah. working on it. You know, ta left Twitter. Yeah. Yeah. He tells me all the time to leave Twitter. And he'll be like the person who will call me and be like, what you doing on Twitter? I'm like, you're not even on Twitter. So whoever's <laughs> snitching on me, I don't appreciate it. Um, so it, it is a matter of, of working out. And, and you do have to be able to, I think what's important is to be able to say, you know what, I, was, I, I went too far, I was wrong. Right. And that's very hard, particularly for journalists who have a lot of ego. But I think in general for people to admit that they've gone too far or, you know, I didn't really engage in a way that I, that I should have. So I even appreciate you asking the question. You're not the first person. Um, in Hampton, this guy, I blocked him. He was like, will you please unblock me? And I was like, maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then I, I went back through his, uh, his Twitter, and I was like, no, I blocked you for a reason, so I'm just going to put it there. Uh, but I think it's something we should all work on. And I, I think in general, this work is just taxing, period. Um, but sitting, you know that it black is. feminists on Twitter um, have got you, particularly those that know how to keep ourselves safe yes. and secure. Because Black women have my back work. so hard, not just on Twitter. They snatched the microphone out of this man's hands uh, the other night in New York when he was starting to talk crazy. And I was like, I don't need to say anything because Black women <laughs> are not having that. So that's amazing. And, and you do have community. I go give talks and just like, like I meet people who I've never met in real life but have like engaged with on Twitter and have gotten to know them, their work. And, and, and I think in that way it can be beautiful. But I, I think you shouldn't spend too much time on it and should take breaks when it starts to feel too personal. Yeah, and also. Are you, do you engage on Twitter? No, well, you know, we, uh, I tweet, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, my, <laughs> I said engage. No, 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 because of PBS, because of finding your roots. Yeah. So we have a zillion people who write. And, uh, but what I respond to is every letter sent, and we get a zillion letters. Mm -hmm. So we have a public email address. So every one that we can, it takes a long time. And then every, every private one. But the letters are more thoughtful than yes. somebody sending you a tweet. And what I learned the hard way when I was um, infamously arrested, um, <laughs> you know, breaking into my own oh, home, house, yeah. was that there are organized hate groups. Yes. So it is not a healthy thing to read. It is not. Uh, because it's not like a normal person saying, you know, Nicole, I didn't like uh, right. that article about Queen and Zing. This is something designed to destroy you. No, that's true. And I didn't even know it existed. Where? But it was like this, you open up and this wave came. And my friends would say, no, you're going to lose your mind. So what we're going to do, you're not going to read any of this stuff. We're going to get you through this. Um, and it's all going to go away. Yes. So it can, it, it can harm you. Uh, and you have to figure out a healthy way to deal with it, just like having ta Coates call you and say, hey, you know, ease up or you're friend, like you yes. said. You know, uh, it's not fair. You, you would have to be a super person to get the vitriol that, some, that you see on, in Twitter exchanges. Yeah. That that not take an effect on you, it's just not right. Uh, and it's not on you to have to defend yourself from lunatics. Yeah. Or racist. And if they think they're getting to you, it's like wolves with the hemophiliac, right? They just keep pricking you and watch you bleed. Can't, you can't let that happen. So, my no, job. They is actually are getting to me, so that's why. I didn't think yeah, then it's time to go. Final question, this person. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for speaking. Uh, Hi. I'm Kevin. I'm a student at MIT. Okay, we'll uh, have two questions. We'll so have Kevin and then before this yeah, woman so, uh, I'll starts this tweeting. Quick. So, uh, <laughs> the historical problem of anti black racism in the U.S. has been dealt with in the most politically conservative way, as history has told us. With one, right, we have the post 1960s economic downturn, right, in which real incomes have declined for the American working class as much as uh, 40%, and also labor union decimation. And two, a naturalization and not an overcoming of the supposed black and working class divide. And so 
So today, with all that in mind, how are the Democrats going to make good on redeeming the successes and failures of the 1960s and 70s such that they aren't in vain and not Trump? Uh, and th my second question is... Oh, no, no. No, 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 no. First of all, that was, you need Albert Einstein to answer the that first question. That was MIT question <laughs> for you right there. <laughs> Only one question. Uh, do you want to uh, uh, take any part of that? I <laughs> mean, you know, I, I'm not a political reporter and I, I don't advocate for the Democrats. So what I imagine is the Democrats are going to do the same shit they've been doing, which is not much. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the New York Times, the voice of the New York Times. <laughs> 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 I tweeted as much. Thank it's you okay. very it's much. already out there. Thank you very much. Hi, <laughs> Final um, question. My name is Chastity Pratt, and I'm a Detroit-based education reporter, and I'm a Neiman Fellow here at Harvard this year. I have Amen. Congrats. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. Uh, really quick question for you. You don't do this kind of journalism, as you said before, without wanting something to happen. You want to have impact. You want to make a change. You want to make a difference. So I was hoping that you could tick for us the list of things that have happened since the project dropped. And this is something that's going to live on. What do you want it to continue to do? Mm. Thank you. That's funny, because on the one hand, I feel like everything I write, I don't expect anything would change. And um, I, some people call me a pessimist. I just think I'm a realist. And I don't, you know, I don't expect things will change from any, any work that I do. Um, with that said, then people are like, why do you keep writing that? And I think because uh, my motivation is one, I'm not going to let us just deny and, and live in oblivion for like the choices that we're making. Um, I think that is very comforting, and I see my role as uh, discomforting um, people. But with that said, I have, in the last few months, felt this very unfamiliar twinge in my heart over here that I'm not used to feeling, which is when you see school children who are reading this and feeling affirmed for the first time, and when you see white children who are now having to trouble the way that they have been taught to think about not just their country, but themselves and, and the benefits and privileges that they have, then you, you do see that and, and when, I, when I pitched the project, I didn't intend it would be a curriculum. That came as a bonus later, so I never had expectation it would be taught in schools. But you see that the power is, what if we don't have to reteach uh, adults what they should have learned right the first time as children? Mm -hmm. And then how can that transform our, our politics and uh, whether or not we will pass certain programs, whether or not we can move the needle on closing these racial inequalities if people are not, uh, children are not raise a wash in this denial about how we got here. Um, so I think that that may be possible. You know, there was this moment in the presidential debates where legitimate candidates talked about reparations. This would not have happened. And I'm not, it's not just my project. It's the work of, you know, ta it's the mm -hmm. work of scholars who have been working on this for a long time, people who have been advocating. But the New York Times does legitimize a conversation in a way that few organizations can. True. Um, you know, Chuck Schumer told the story of my dad in Congress. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting at home in my chair just like bawling like a baby because this was a black man born on a cotton plantation. Sorry. No, it's okay. Take your time. Um, in apartheid Mississippi who died before he was even old enough to get Social Security and who died thinking that his life had been completely meaningless, that he had nothing to will to anyone, he had nothing to give to anyone, he, you know, died being a bus driver. Uh, and to think like that this man's story was told in the halls of Congress in a conversation about uh, when are we going to have a reckoning for what has been done, um, I think shows the power of what journalism can do. And I gave a talk um, to the black congressional aides and uh, Representative Sheila Jackson came up. My classmate, and, yeah. Right, who, you know, they've been trying to get just H.R. 40 to study reparations right. for 40 years. John Conyers died this year. This is the 40th anniversary of him first introducing that bill. If we can even move that forward, mm -hmm. where we can at least begin to study the question of what do we do with what has been done, I think that that uh, would actually be more than what I hope for, but that's because I'm not a hopeful person. No, well, we don't believe that. 
we believe <laughs> we believe that you get up and you write because you do think that knowledge matters, communication it does. matters, Absolutely. and that you can uh, an agency can make a better day. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome, <laughs> welcome Thank Nicole, you. Hannah, Jones.